Okay, let's take it away. Welcome everyone to this second event in our 2021 speaker series, Taking the Digital Welfare State to Court. My name is Judith Rahofer and I am DFF's legal officer. Um, with me are my colleagues, Jonathan McCulley, DFF's legal advisor and our events officer, Jihan Jadran. Together, we'll work behind the scenes today to ensure that this webinar goes smoothly and is not plagued by any technical difficulties. To give you all a bit of background to the series itself, um, over the past two years, the protection and promotion of human rights in the context of the digital welfare state has been a major focus of DFF's work. We are particularly concerned that the increased use of digital technologies and automated decision-making systems in social security and welfare contexts violates human rights and exacerbates the over-policing and penalizing and exclusion of marginalizing communities and those who are in need of vital support. Uh, we've already discussed these issues at a number of our workshops, like for instance, our litigating algorithm workshop in 2019. We've also held a number of one-on-one -on -one and group consultations with a range of organizations working on the topic. And based on these consultations, we've already produced a, strategy docu a strategic document um, to inspire conversations on how strategic litigation can be used as part of a broader strategy to address the harms of the digital welfare state. You can find that strategic document and more information about our activities uh, in this area on the DFF website. And my colleague Johnson is also going to share the links in the chat. Uh, you will be able to see them there. We also continue to engage with a range of other organizations on this topic, including racial, social and economic justice organizations as part of our ongoing Digital Rights for All project. Our objective here is to provide a space to the people most affected by harmful use of technologies, but who are often not the ones leading the advocacy policy or strategic litigation work. And we do this essentially to create a space that allows them to develop their own agenda. Um, that's a process that our colleague Laurence Meyer, who leads on that project, has just summarized in a really interesting blog that I can actually just uh, recommend to everybody uh, as nothing about us without us. This year's speaker series seeks to complement that work by exploring a range of cases from different jurisdictions and relating to a range of different welfare state issues to show how strategic litigation can be used by and in collaboration with these communities to protect their digital and human rights. The topic of today's event is profiling algorithms, safeguarding the unemployed in Poland, and it looks at an automated decision-making system that was introduced by the Polish Ministry of Labor and Social Policy in 2014, which profiled unemployed individuals based on their personal characteristics. Uh, the tool was then used to determine what kind of support those individuals would receive from the local labor offices. The system was successfully challenged by Polish digital rights NGO Panopticon, with the result that in 2008, Poland's constitutional court ruled that the ministry's use of this profiling tool violated the Polish constitution. With us today are Dr. Jadrek Niklas, a research associate at Cardiff University School of Journalism, Media and Culture and uh, the Data Justice Lab, and Dr. Cengiz Baskanmas, who is a postdoc at the Free University in Berlin and also a research associate at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, also in Berlin. Before rejoining academia, Jadrek was a legal and policy specialist at Panopticon, uh, where he worked on policies relating to data protection, automated decision-making, surveillance uh, of vulnerable groups, and so on. And that's, of course, also how he became involved in the case that we're going to hear about today. He now works with Lina Denchik at the Data Justice Project in Cardiff, where he explores the role of emerging digital technologies in the operations of state and public institutions and their social justice implications. He holds a PhD in international public law from the University of Warsaw and is the author of several journal articles and reports related to data-driven technologies, human rights, and political theory. Cengiz Vasganmas is currently the operational manager of the research project Open Access in the Legal Sciences at the Free University of Berlin and also an associate of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. His research is primarily concerned with critical race theory, diversity and intersectionality, and digitalization. And he's the author of a book, Law and Racism, The Prohibition of Discrimination on the Basis of Race, in which he explores human rights protections against racial and ethnic discrimination. He is a co-founder of Critical Race Theory Europe, 
which is playing a key role in the development of a critical race theory network in the European region. And together with Kimberley Crenshaw, he organized the first symposium on critical race theory in Europe and Germany at the Humboldt University in Berlin in 2012. I will shortly be handing over to Cengiz as the moderator of this event, and he and Yedrek will then spend about 30 minutes to talk about the background of the case and the lessons we can learn from it. And while they are talking, I would like to encourage all of our listeners to use the Q&A function to ask questions that you may have on the case. Um, there is a Q&A tab that can be found at the bottom of the right uh, of the screen to the right. We have about 20 minutes towards the end of the webinar to allow Yedrek to answer as many of your questions as possible. So please. Do not wait necessarily until, you know, this is all over, uh, you know, capture the question when you think of it and just add it to the Q&A and we're basically just going to add it to the list. And on that note, and without further ado, Cengiz, Yedrek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Thank you for this nice conversation. I am so delighted to have this conversation with my um, colleague Yedrick and I am totally inspired already while I was actually preparing my, um, mod my function as moderation here. Um, Yedrick, I would like to start with a very basic question. Would you like um, to tell us just like the basic information, the context about the case. So what's the origin story of this case? How did it come about and who was much more involved? And as you have answered this, I will maybe also continue with some other questions um, I have for you today, please. Perfect, let's start with the, uh, with the origin story. And, and thank you DFF for organizing this. It's a real pleasure to to talk about this case that I think is also not as well recognized as I think it should be. So the origin story and the bigger context is that in 2013, uh, Polish Minister of Labor and uh, Social Security, uh, they start thinking about reforming uh, the system of uh, uh, public employment uh, uh, system. This is like the, the system welfare, part of welfare administration that is providing uh, help and assistance to people who are in the crisis of unemployment. Uh, you know, this is like a big welfare institution in Poland. This is like almost 360 local job centers all over the country. They are providing, they have a, a big budget. They are providing a lot of assistance. It's a complex um, and uh, although big and quite well funded, it's still very dysfunctional. And at some point, uh, because also the, the, the resources, as in all welfare systems, are quite, you know, are, are quite scarce, um, the, the, the government is deciding, like, well, we need to divide those resources in a better way, and we need to like, have some kind of tools to do it. And that's why we are trying to introduce these profiling mechanisms. That, on the other hand, it's also uh, being used in many different countries. We have also examples in Austria, in Portugal, in Spain. Oh, I think it's all over the Europe. And so for, for a long time, it was also a thing that was advocated, for example, by OECD and European Union. And in countries like uh, Poland, and I think also Hungary, you know, it's also like a Western Eastern uh, game and so thinking how, how we can uh, jump into this modernization uh, train with uh, with being more as uh, as West. So the 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 reform is is coming. Uh, they are trying to make a new law that is introducing this profiling. Basically, it's this dividing profiling of unemployed people into three categories based on like twenty five data different different data points. Each data point is uh, assigned with a particular score uh, from one to I think to twelve. It's gender, uh, education, but also uh, things like how far do you live from the bigger city? How long have you been unemployed? So those kind of information. And each is assigned to particular, uh, particular points. You know, Yedrick, I was wondering um, whether as a critical race scholar, whether race was one of the factors uh, since one of the most prominent profilings we know is racial profiling, right? And but what does it tell us if race is missing here? Does it mean that race is in the Polish context not relevant or does it mean that there was a blind spot? <laughs> it's a very good question. And uh, I, I will just just give me a second because I will I will 
I, you want to come back go, to this later? I will. I, no, no, I will go to this uh, to this question in, in just a second because um, I want to just give you a context where we started working on this when I was working at Panoptica. Great. Because our organization was mostly focused on uh, legislation and providing legal opinion to draft bills, uh, and, and this is how we um, uh, start looking. We were start, start looking at this at this provision, and there were really interesting information and really interesting process going on. Um, and one of the biggest um, at back, back at then by advocacy point was that profiling should be not based on sensitive data. And that's why, for example, uh, like race, uh, uh, but also uh, disability. Um, for example, disability at some point, it was, it was erased from the idea to be included in the profiling uh, system. Race was never a thing. Um, I think they would not dare to, 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 to add it. And I think this is a kind of also a very strange European approach to race or even in this context, I think, ethnicity. Uh, I heard discussions because that was a, a thing in Polish context that maybe not a race, but ethnicity, because like there, at that time there was also a, kind of a, a big group of Chechenian uh, migrants in Poland. And that was, a, you know, most of them were unemployed and uh, it wasn't information for job centers uh, probably to also to, to, to process. But at the end, in this profiling mechanism, it was not included. But I think it's also a very interesting uh, idea also when you compare this to the other questions, what is happening also in Eastern Europe. And in exactly, Europe. absolutely. Um, but going back maybe also to, so we started doing this this kind of uh, advocacy around this, uh, around this profiling mechanism, mostly based on the argument of transparency that uh, we, were, we, we saw that yeah. like the previous um, system of uh, providing assistance to, to, to unemployed people, it was based on the very simple um, categories that were you know, and enlist, enlisted in the in, in the law. Like, if you are a single mother, you were allowed to have this particular uh, kind of assistance. If you were a, a, a person that is that is fifty plus, you were allowed to have specific kind of assistance. But now they wanted to create more sophisticated mechanism to assess people, to what kind of categories you are, uh, and. While they were saying it is more individualized. Yedrick, just a technical issue. Could you, would you be so nice and hold your um, mic a little bit closer to your... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I know. Microphone is not perfect, but I hope you, you can still... But see. that's an excellent sound right now. Yeah, perfect. So, um, uh, so the argument was that from the side of the government that they wanted to introduce more individualized system to provide this, this help to the unemployed. But, they, but at the end, they were creating a very, I would say, rough categorization and uh, dividing people into three big categories. The first one was that people like higher education, they know languages, so maybe they, they are now unemployed, but they don't need our help, uh, which makes some sense from from the perspective of the institution that do not have enough money to provide assistance to everybody. And by I assistance, I mean not uh, welfare benefits, but some sort of training, mm -hmm. um, like uh, state-subsidized internship, something like that, some additional things that help you to get out from being unemployed. The second category, the people, the biggest category, where the people that, well, they have some problems, but we can help them and we can fix their problems. And the third category was the people, like I would say, helpless. Um, so they are, like, for example, single moms that are living in the smaller villages. So maybe we should not direct assistance to them. Maybe that's the social security uh, branch of welfare state, uh, but not us. But, you know, it sounds pretty rational at the beginning, but at the end when we were... Uh, and this is later stage of this of the, of this uh, of this uh, of this case. And I prepared a diagram that just shows also our work and uh, how this case evolved uh, uh, over many years of uh, litigating, advoc advocating, um, etc. Uh, so at the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm still talking about uh, yes. the, the the legislative process because the the, the system. But where we were trying to, 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 to advocate, it was still a draft bill, but it came into force in uh, 2014 as a part of this bigger reform. Um, and this is how but where, where things get really interesting and how the whole big thing in, in, in our organization back then started. So um, 
first of all, uh, like like the first interactions we have with the Ministry of Labour was also that we wanted to get uh, the questions that were asked during the profiling um, uh, uh, profiling uh, moment, I would say, because the profiling was that you know if you are unemployed, you're going to the job centre um, and you're being asked many different questions, and based on those questions, you're being assessed i would say yeah and just a quick question edward um we are having uh, questions from attendees and um you know um i was also not quite sure about it i want to make sure that i um overheard something to what extent was education a factor in the profiling and um, was it much more a determining factor at all in the system uh, would you like to elaborate more on that yeah yeah it was absolutely um, uh, a factor in that and definitely like if you are if you had better education you receive different points uh than if you have lower education but it completely makes sense you know like um if yeah. you have there's, there's education um it's a degree i would say close to to class as a category <laughs> i would say yes on the other hand a polish uh, higher education system is quite, I would say, strange because, and it is also a case for most Eastern European countries, we have a very high uh, level of people with higher education degrees, like really high, much higher than, uh, for example, many uh, Western countries, but it is also bad education, I would say. So it's oh, not, uh, like the, 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 the higher degree does not always say it about your class, uh, the kind of university you are going, uh, it says mm -hmm. much more. So it's rather formal. But on the other hand, also like gender was also an element of this assessment, which is yeah. quite, quite tricky. Um, I remember it was just a one like women, uh, men were, uh, were received like they, they received zero points. Women received one point, which is not a big difference in the whole scheme of, 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 of assessing. But at that, at that point, uh, it, it gave some sound of, sort of indication that women can end up more easily in the third category that is not receiving anything from from the job centers and yeah. especially if it was combined with being a single mother uh, or a person like that is um, that that is giving some sort of assistance to elderly pa parents for example that's yeah. that was a thing so it was a gender uh, issue at the end just to wrap up a little bit yeah. um, so um, understanding that there um, there is this profiling momentum where you have three profiles and uh, people who are the first profile were, I mean, the most successful um, profile or the most second successful. second profile. I would say. Oh well, yeah. well, it depends. Yeah, well, yeah. Exa yeah. So exactly, but. Um, what was the legal argument about the ombudsman? The Polish ombudsman made, I think, um, like a double track argument. Correct? If I'm not, uh, if I didn't misread, uh, misread yeah. the um, argument. So, on the one hand, they're actually attacking the profiling as being unconstitutional, and on the other hand, that the delegation of powers would be actually unconstitutional. Um, can you elaborate more on that, and maybe also? Um, tell us what the court actually found. Yeah, just I would just give uh, one small map of also what we have done in this case, because on some point yeah. we were asking, for example, using freedom of information requests, the question that we're asking in profiling, that was one case, and we received them from the Ministry of, of Labor. The second FOIA request was about the scores that were assigned to particular answers during the profiling uh, moment let's say let's go like that and then that's that's something that we haven't received at the beginning but we went to the court um that was in 2015 i guess and the ruling was in 2016. uh so it was a uh, one first litigation and that was the argument that panopticon and other activists were saying uh, and this was related by transparency of this whole mechanism but then you may you have to you have to understand that in Polish uh, system, um, NGOs cannot easily go to the constitutional court. But mm -hmm. who can is the Human Rights Commissioner or, or, or the Ombudsman. And we twice approach Ombudsman uh, to first of all provide some arguments uh, to them. Uh, and they are uh, at least on our side, the arguments were really 
it was a lot of that, I would say. The first one was about transparency of the system. The second was very formal, I would say, because in Polish legal system, uh, there are two kinds of, uh, of laws or, or bills. The first one are bills that are uh, accepted by the parliament. Yes. So they are called like the bills, like the proper bills. Uh, and the second are regulations that are um, issued by the ministries and government. So this is like an executive, like I would say. Exactly. And, and uh, most of those things are, are just to provide some you know, specificity or technical aspects that are specifying the, 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 the legal bill. And in this case, that was the most important thing was at the end, I, I would say then, that this is what, what the Constitutional Court said, that the things that are in the Executive Act uh, that was issued by the government, the Ministry of Labour, should be in the, in the bill. Because in the Polish Constitution, uh, the, any kind of uh, uh, provisions that are limiting right to data protection and privacy should be in the bill that is accepted by the parliament and not by the regulation. And that was the one of the most fundamental arguments. They have it is very formal, I would say, and there is nothing yes. incident about that. So that was something that we could work with. Uh, that was the second argument. But other arguments also were uh, related to the discrimination because at the end we received those scores and we saw that women are uh, assessed different than men. First. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the fourth argument was related that, well, when there is this kind of moment of automatic decision making, the unemployed people cannot, uh, they do not have any kind of uh, way to request uh, a new decision that is not made by the, by the, by the machine or, or the computer at the end. Because uh, this was still, you know, this is a very, that was a very simple from the technological point of view system, but it was still done by the, by the, by, the, by the computer and the IT system that was used by the Ministry of Labor. So we, approaching those arguments, uh, with, with those arguments, we went to Human Rights Commissioner twice. And at the end, in 2016, I guess, uh, he uh, went, he used those two arguments. The formal one, the difference between the, um, and the, the bill and the regulation, executive regulation, and the lack of um, this this possibility to, to to challenge the decision by the unemployed, uh, the decision that has been based made by the by the computer, and that was the base of the of 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 his statement to the constitutional tribunal that started this whole uh, this whole this whole process that took two years to finish. Uh, constitutional tribunal for two years was debating. Or proceeding, I would say. <coughs> sorry. Uh, uh, and <coughs> sorry, I'll just take some more. Yeah, please. And maybe on this occasion, um, I would appreciate if you um, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm using my hands a lot. And <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry for. Yeah, no, uh, no, no. Please, please, please do. And yeah. So, and just, yeah, sorry. Okay. Well, can you also like um, tell us what the litigation has achieved so far, and 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 so where are we today? And when you look back to what happened, and I mean, what, because the course, the court, uh, the tribunal, the constitutional tribunal, uh, is partially struck down. Um, as far <laughs> as I am not misinformed, the new regulation abandoned the profiling, although the constitutional the tribunal did not actually find that unconstitutional. I think that's a very nice side effect. Uh, because in the beginning, when I was reading, uh, by the way, is there an English translation of the court decision? Um, I think there is a summary that uh, I'm okay. not sure if we can share it on chat. Maybe we can share it later. Exactly. We can mm -hmm. Share it on later. Um, it is exactly what you said because the constitutional tribunal just said that, like, based on those two arguments. First of all, it said that there is nothing unconstitutional in this machine, uh, in those machines making those decisions, uh, because in the Polish administrative law you still ca can challenge this kind of decision. Maybe not decision made by a machine, but at the end. The decision of, for example, of you not receiving some sort of assistance. That that's, that's exactly. That's and profiling was just one of the factors, right? And that's what it, it was not determining, right? 
it was not determining. However, exactly, <laughs> you know, of course, it was. It is very interesting because um, also at some point we received, uh, we did like a lot as a panopticon. We did a, a big, uh, I would say, uh, a research that took a couple of months to understand how the system works in practice and what we what we we saw in data was that well it was not determining uh at the end the machines were not determined but well they did actually and uh, nobody was challenging on the side of the street work uh, as, um, st like the street level uh, bureaucrats they were not challenging what the computer was saying uh, at least at the beginning so the constitutional court said that well that part is not like you can still challenge this in some way uh but the, from the formal perspective, so this difference between the law, like the bill and the regulation, that's yes. something. So it is was, it was a very conservative decision, I would say. There is nothing precedent about that. But at the end, um, and it is also a political, uh, it is also a thing that I, I think it's very interesting that also showed that those litigations are not always like the silver bullets. That there's, there, there are more things happening. And for example, here, what was absolutely also important was that at some point, um, we have this institution that is called Supreme Audit Office. That it's a very strong institution in Polish system and in many Eastern European countries. They did a, a inspection of this provider mechanism, and it said that well, it is not working. It's bad, and it's like not effective mm -hmm. in providing um, the assistance that that Ministry of Labor should provide. So um, uh, this audit, the Constitutional Tribunal uh, uh, decision. Like they basically create uh, an app, uh, create a, a momentum to change the law, and the Ministry of Labor was saying, "Well, so maybe after the, after those after those years that we have been trying to use it, we will, we will change it completely and we will abandon the system you know, because it's basically it's not working uh, from many different uh, perspectives and using many different arguments." Uh, from transparency, effectiveness, uh, also the, 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 the formal aspects uh, that was raised by the Constitutional Court. So there are many different arguments that, that, uh, that help to build this momentum to change the law. So this never, uh, uh, it was never a litigation, but it, of course, helped a lot. Uh, There's also not the you know, most covered issue in the Polish press, but it was still also very interesting for, for many different journalists. And it was something very new in the... In, you know, in the Polish context of administration and receiving welfare, etc. I see. Yedrek, if you um, look back um, today, um, what is your conclusion? Are you happy with the outcome of uh, the case? And um, are there some uh, side effects that you're not really happy with? And so um, what work is still to be done uh, by court and governments? And um, so what's your expertise on that? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's... Did you, did you yeah. face some ethical issues as well? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. I think that's... Uh, because the outcomes of the of this mechanism, and I think I forgot also about one important thing, in, especially in, in the work that we have been doing at one of them, that it was the first time that we have been receiving so many letters, emails uh, from people telling their stories. Because when profiling mechanism uh, uh, was in force, uh, there was a lot of drama about that. Uh, like drama, I mean like the proper dramatic. Uh, 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 events for many people that like they were not receiving the assistance they were expected to receive and uh, you know when you're a single mom or uh, you're like like for example this issue of the inter like subsidized internship at companies that was something that helped a lot of people and suddenly they are not allowed to get it um, so we are receiving those letters we are receiving telephones we are receiving emails uh, and that was the first time as a digital rights organization that we are having those kind of, I would say, victims. Uh, and that's a very important element of this whole job. And also that gave me personally also a lot of strength, you know, to do it for so many years. It was very emotional about that uh, at, this, at this time. But what is, I think, very interesting uh, in the sense that uh, is the strange outcome of this, is that after so many years, and after, especially also when we... You know, on, on our webpage, we published uh, the scores, we published uh, the questions. So for many people, it was also a resource that they could use when they are going to the job centers. And at the end, also game a system a little bit. So it's, uh, 
it's it's that that's one the first of ethical question I would say for any kind of digital organization that this you know showing let's say for the for for, for the terms of this conversation an algorithm but of course this is not an algorithm or code it's rather how to use the system in your own games at, at some point. So, so people, are, just a quick question there. Yeah, yeah. So um, to understand, like, what are the very specific implications for people uh, with respect to their score? So uh, um, how did they, how did this uh, work in every day in the practical? Can you give a couple of examples maybe? Uh, yeah, so basically when, for example, so you're unemployed and you're, when you're being profiled as this third profile, for example. So um, before the abandoned, that, can we say the abandoned? The abandoned, yeah. So yeah. or the the trash people, I would say, even in, in more uh, in more harsh language. But when you are this kind of uh, in your in this group, before that, you can apply for most of the things that you can get from the job center, uh, um, courses, trainings, and the most important thing the subsidized internship at the company. So the, con the state is paying for six months of your salary in the company. And after that, you will get a job uh, because you will stay at the company. The company is uh, getting something. Every everybody basically is, is happy about that. Uh, and that was a crucial element. And when you're landing in the third category, you are not receiving it. You are not even allowed to apply for that. Uh, I see. That's very practical. That's very specific. People that's feel very, that. Yeah, that's very specific. And also, you know, it was also interesting for us at this moment when we were discovering what is happening uh, uh, in practice. You know, we were not, we know nothing about welfare states, uh, mechanism and system. And we need to have this cooperation, for example, with sociologists and experts in the welfare from early beginning to understand what is happening because it was, there was a lot of nitty gritty about receiving this kind of assistance, receiving this kind of benefit. And it was like a lot of knowledge you have to get before you even start any kind of litigation and focus that. That's process. empirical research. And that was completely an empirical research. Um, but going back to the outcomes at the end of, uh, let's say like the after the Constitutional Court in uh, 2018 is saying, well, it's unconstitutional um, in 19, sorry. Um, so we are receiving... Mm, I saw that uh, uh, we are receiving mails that people, some people are happy because it was uh, the whole profiling system makes no sense for many of the people. But some of them are saying, what have you done? Mm. Because, um, you know, the Polish system uh, of providing uh, assistance to unemployed have, since 1990 has changed 92 times. It's an unstable system. So when you have something and when you can... Use it for your own gains. Also, um, you 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 prioritize stability over, I would say, procedural fairness uh, to some extent. From the perspective, of course, of digital or human rights advocates that that see it as a priority, and I think there is a lot of things going on here and a lot of tensions. I'm not saying that there is uh, always tension between, for example, stability of the welfare system and the procedural fairness or fighting for procedural fairness, but it can be. And that was something that uh, when I realized, okay, so this is uh, when, you know, when we are litigating, when we are advocating in this context of digital welfare uh, yes. issues, we are messing with people's lives. Uh, we need to be absolutely aware of that. And most of the organizations, I feel, uh, in the field of digital rights, they have not enough knowledge about the systems. It is not like, you know, it was a very comfortable situation when we were like litigating against police and uh, secret service. It is completely David versus Goliath. Uh, very nice story to sell. But when you are going and entering to the welfare systems, this is something much more complex and complicated. And this is absolutely not David versus Goliath's story. However, I would like to sell it uh, as one. Um, yes. This is absolutely about messing people's lives to some to some extent. So what so what was your what's your general impression um, working with the communities? Um, are you still in touch with the communities you worked with? And how was at that moment working with the communities? Um, did you face some challenges? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, first of all, there is not, no such thing as a community of people, of unemployed people. Unemployed people, are, this is like a very diverse group. Uh, 
However, we, uh, when I was then working at Panopticon, we reached the organizations that are fighting for uh, uh, people in the crisis of poverty, for example, or the crisis of homeless, because they are also, these are also like one of the most affected groups in the unemployment system as well. And we were trying to have this conversation. Also during our the research project, we have been doing a lot of interviews with unemployed people. So we were trying to get as much knowledge about their experience as, as, it, as, it, as it is possible. So that was the most important, but I would say that there is, that there was still lack of some sort of, you know, community. It was rather us, organization that is having some sort of resources uh, to do a lot of litigation and advocacy and a group of citizens that may benefit from, from it. The important element that helped us a lot, and that was uh, the few sociologists, especially Karolina Sztandarska, who is now also doing big projects on profiling and trying to understand what happened uh, over those years, that they help us a lot to understand uh, the whole system. And that was absolutely crucial. And I would suggest in everybody, if anybody would like to do any kind of advocacy or any kind of thing related to digital welfare state, you need to have support from this side. Uh, if you only have knowledge about data protection, sorry, no, this is mm -hmm. not enough to enter this, uh, to, to enter this uh, uh, theme and uh, issue and address it from somehow. I have a couple of more questions to you, Yedrek, but um, also to the audience. Please feel free to um, start to ask your questions in um, um, the Q&A bar. You will find the Q&A bar on the bottom of your screen. And, um, and I will pick up your questions and uh, address that to Yedrek. Yedrek, you know what I find very interesting is that you actually went to the constitutional court that is today very disputed, <laughs> the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. As we might know, last week, um, the Constitutional Tribunal declared um, EU law as non-compatible with some provisions of the Polish Constitution. So how do you feel about that? So you went to the Polish Constitution to find some help and by that, by doing that, actually, you're legitimizing the constitutional court. At the same time, people are also the voices of people who are saying that this is a almost illegitimate court. Um, um, I think there is a tension there. <laughs> How do you feel as a, a Polish legal activist about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, well. And how do you see the future from here? Oh, that's that's a very tricky thing, uh, but let me explain also a little bit. You know, the, the the whole mess of the court it didn't start just like last week. It's a thing. It is a drama that is happening since 2016 when the new government, the conservative government, uh, took power and uh, they start also messing with the constitutional uh, uh, court, uh, constitutional court judges nomination, and that was the whole thing that. Yes, definitely. This, this, this problem. Uh, and now, uh, now, basically, you know, as I was saying, that we 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 challenge uh, this, this 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 law indirectly because through the Human Rights Commission uh, office um, uh, to the to the Constitutional Court. And now, what I know from the Human Rights Commission uh, office is that well, they are not challenging, they are not addressing uh, bills to the Constitutional Court because they see it illegitimate. So. Um, I think now this this way of challenging law in Poland does not exist. I, this is something, uh, and this is you know big politics that is happening around us, and uh, it's not only Poland. I guess it is also Hungary and probably maybe hope, and hopefully not other countries in the future. But who knows uh, in those different times and difficult and different and strange times, um, you can you know like you can still think about. Uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights, but you know, like it's nice to have a precedent, but it will not change the law, especially when mm -hmm. when you have a government that is not so strict on thinking about human rights treaties and, and, and other things. So it is a it is a big thing. What to do now? Uh, I don't know. Like I think the the activists that are now 
working still probably at Panopticon, but also Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, would, 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 would say that it's not like helpless completely, but it definitely limited the ways how you can challenge the things. Um, and you need to be more creative, uh, probably more grassroots campaigns and so those kind of uh, activities. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. You, you know, exactly, Idrik. I would also add that and sometimes even losing a case might have helped advance the case more than actually winning it. It all depends how actually you um, constitute or you... Um, um, go forward to the strategic litigation. The winning is always not uh, winning at the end. Sometimes you can lose a case, but uh, you can achieve maybe your goal much more with a loss. So even to come back to the question of to what extent it from now on in the future, it would be legitimated to address the questions to the constitutional tribunal, maybe yeah, other uh, legal avenues should be explored within the uh, national legal order, but also maybe internationally and European wide. Yeah, probably. And I also want the, this is also an interesting element of this for this case that the 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 conservative government that was that took power in 2016, he it was against the profiling mechanism from the beginning. And the profiling mechanism was introduced by the liberal government that uh, that was uh, was before. So you know there's also a lot of what was the reasoning? Why exactly were they against it? Uh, well they were not saying Directly that they are against it, but they saw, like they like the the, the new government, uh, which is conservative and rather nationalistic. It is still a government that is giving more uh, welfare spending. Basically, uh, the, he it introduced a lot of new uh, social security programs. And the previous government, while it was liberal in this, you know, I would say procedural aspect, it was still a neoliberal government that was cutting welfare. So it's also very strange, really different dynamics and the big politics happening around that. Uh, you, you know what? This really reminds me at the um, Agenda 2020, 2020 in Germany, where Schroeder was actually the one who introduced like the so-called hard fear. Um, and that was a real breach, a real breach in the so far social uh, benefit system. Uh, in, in, and now actually they want to undo it in some way because they see that the consequences of that for people is uh, all but good. Yeah, and I think, you know, with this uh, with this this issue, with this, what I would just said, and also what you just, just described with this politics, also around the welfare state, and I think that's, that's also another question for digital rights activists because they were not for a very long time. They were not even thinking what is their attitude to the welfare system. How do they? Because you know, well, digital rights organizations, they or at least from my experience, we are we have been kind of this kind of anarchistic, more you know, individualistic privacy, individual privacy things. But now we, when we we if, if you for example would like to go into this kind of direction of thinking about digital welfare state. Well, you need to think also about completely different things. It's, for example, welfare and uh, also this kind of uh, austerity thing that was were happening in this context. It's a very politi big political question. And I think um, the community around digital rights have not been thinking about this yet. I think that's a very good, good, good moment to think about those things. But, you know, there is a lot of issues that need to be digested, I would say, and they have not been... Um, for a very long time. This this also sounds like um Gidrick, um to to me that like you know in the beginning when the liberal state was there and the constitution was enacted in Germany, freedom was much more important than equality. And today, in the legal doctrine, equality, it is unthinkable to uh, not to include uh, equality, at least the progressive legal doctrine is so far. So it, it, it sounds like also digital rights movements were actually much more actually concerned with freedoms than actually with structural inequality. And this case shows very well that um, also digital freedom or the digital uh, rights activists should definitely keep an eye on structural inequalities that actually are part of uh, the unequal freedoms, right? Yeah, and I think that we are slowly starting uh, going to this direction. We can see many work that is happening, for example, in Edri. Uh, if there is anybody from Edri, 
you have, you're doing a really great job also in, in these terms. And especially the whole, you know, now discussion about AI and those kind of things that are creating some new sort of inequalities. This is a really good starting moment to raise different questions about digital rights. And I think DFF is also doing a really great job in starting those kind of conversations. But I think it's still not enough. It, I, it definitely changed a lot. And I've been here you know, here, I mean, in, in, in this in discussion since 2000, 2011, so I can see also how how it evolved. Uh, but I think it's still something that uh, the questions about equality is is a big thing. And I remember, you know, even, you know, the, one of the most important slogans for digital rights, like freedom, not fear. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, uh, it's slightly different now, isn't it? <laughs> Or maybe it should be, or maybe should we should add something something else, uh, maybe equality and freedom, not fear and uh, neoliberalism. I don't know. Um, that's so, you know, then I think it's very important um, um, to what extent people are aware of these systems, like their public awareness, because it, it, it of course, definitely... Um, when whenever um, algorithm algorithms are at work, it doesn't feel like that discriminating when a public officer is discriminating against you because of your race, gender, or ethnicity, or or, or your um, disability. So, uh, what can we do to actually make this more uh, salient that the public awareness towards algorithms? Well, you know, I would say we're like when we publish, for example, the the materials that we received from the Ministry of Labor, I, I mm-hmm. mean, the, the scoring system and the, the questions, people like for, first of all, that was our web page went down when it was published because so many people were interested in that. So it's not that people do not see those things work; they know if those th- things happen, especially you know, in such things as welfare system. If 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 their life depends on it. Of course, that's completely different uh, element if those things are you know, just part of the bigger decision-making systems. And here, I really don't know what to do. It's like just raising awareness as we have been doing for many years. And, but it's, is it effective? I, I don't know. But the things when, when you can really connect it to the re- real life struggles, this is something that people are interested, are very interested. They want to know more. Uh, also, they need resources to help uh, to help them. Basically. That's also, I think, now I'm, when I'm thinking um, your question about the whole constitutional court and political issues around that, well, receiving information from the government, which is still possible in Poland, I guess, um, through FOIA requests and giving resources to people, well, you don't need to go to constitutional courts to help people from, you know, from, from the ground, basically, and giving them some sort of tools that in this, for example, case or those those type of case, can, those type of case can can help a lot. Uh, I would say. However, it raises ethical questions of gaming the system or whatever. Um, this this is something that that helps uh, in their life struggles with the algorithmic system or semi-algorithmic system. There is also a question uh, with respect to the technology. So the question is: Could technology or data play um, a, or data play a positive role? Uh, the, I mean, for building mutual support mechanism for people. Well, huh. definitely, because I think, you know, from the 70s, uh, data processing systems in the, in the context of the European welfare system, this is the core of them. So it is, they are helping because, you know, the whole systems, uh, they are based on data, processing data. There is no welfare system without processing information. Maybe you can think about some kind of universal basic income that everybody's at some point receiving the, the, the amount of money, but data is building welfare system. So it is already happening. Of course, we, we can see some new kind of AI system. And on the other hand, I haven't seen, uh, because I'm following, of course, this, this, those, the, the, those, those developments with AI in the, in the particular uh, in the particular welfare administration aspect, I haven't seen such a like in, a, in, a, in anything like very really perfect example of very good thing. Uh, maybe they are some, and they are not highlighted. I would like to see that, uh, but we need to be very aware that computer and data systems are already part of, and they are helping us a lot. Uh, that's something that I would really like to stress. 
And one more question, uh, Edric. I know we're um, talking almost one hour and you must be also, um, you're talking uh, very concentrated and um, it is, I can imagine, also tiring. But um, this is a tough question, I think. What was the role of the right to social security in this litigation? So we're talking about effective remedy, about non-discrimination, about transparency, but what role, if any, did the right to social security play in legal policy and social discourse on the profile at all? Uh, unfortunately, I would say none. Um, I've been trying to use uh, the European social charter argument, uh, this advocacy thing, uh, because, for example, under the right to work, uh, there are also provisions related to transparency of the unemployment mechanism uh, systems, uh, either computer computerized or not. Unfortunately, the status of social rights. Very first of all, in, like in like in Polish constitution, we have uh, the chapter about social rights. So we slightly can use it, but they are not. You know, it's. It's not as, as a strong framework as, for example, rights of privacy, unfortunately. Uh, uh, the European Social Charter is a very weak treaty, unfortunately, as well. Um, so it is very hard. I didn't understand. The European Social Charter was? It's a very uh, weak legal instrument. Yeah. Uh, if, if, you who, if, well, if, if you don't know, this is like the treaty that was uh, uh, introduced in the 1960s. It's... It's a basically a list of uh, social rights in Europe. Uh, most of the European countries are, are uh, assign it, they sign it, but it does not give a lot of, you know, space to advocate. Or maybe advocate, yes, but litigate, uh, not so much. So unfortunately, uh, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's a difference between rights to social, 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 social security and I would say um, equal redistribution, because that was more, in, in this sense, that was some sort of more political argument. And for example, it was raised by some union, trade unions uh, that were trying to also advocate uh, against this profiling mechanism. Um, uh, but it was not the strongest still argument. And we, when we were in conversation with the ombudsman, uh, they also didn't want to use this argument. For, it was also very interesting because you know, in the ombudsman office, they have the separate department for labor and social security and separate uh, department yes. for political and uh, civil rights. And that was a case for civil uh, rights, not the labor and social security. Social security, said it's data protection, so it's not us, basically. Uh, it's a very interesting dynamic also from institutional uh, point of view, how to, uh, yeah, how to yes. approach those issues. Sorry. Sorry, either. In the beginning, you also made some reference to other countries. You, you know, I'm still not very clear with respect to the Polish security system since I'm not from Poland and I haven't been living there. But can you like contextualize much more Poland within the European social security systems? How would you see Poland as from a social security perspective? Um, was, the German, the German, and some other Western European countries are the only references, only countries I know. I'm aware of. Um, where would you locate the, the social security system of Poland within the European context? Yeah, like I think it's, uh, you know, also it evolved over the years. When we started, uh, and when the, the 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 reform and the profiling mechanism was introduced, it was still, I would say, post-socialist. Uh, social security system. However, that went through kind of neoliberal uh, reforms during the 90s that, you know, like it was tough times, uh, a lot of uh, cuts, um, neoliberals in power. So it was not great. And 2011, just after also the crisis, uh, however, we didn't have a huge unemployment. Uh, well, no, unemployment was so, uh, quite huge, but, you know, the benefits are very low. Uh, also, I was unemployed back then, and I, I used uh, job center. It is not a nice place to go. Like really, like it's a it's a it's a tough institution. Nobody have any kind of time. Uh, uh, it's 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 not it's no it was not a place that you wanted to be part of. Uh, uh, things have changed, fortunately, on or unfortunately, probably fortunately, especially with this. Uh, nationalistic government, I would say the the the, the, the provisions are 
are much more uh, generous uh, in this matter. Uh, so we have those kind of benefits that are um, also interesting from the computer side. Like they are using a lot of computer systems now also to give benefits to people. They are much higher. They are like allowance for families. I would say it's quite generous comparing to, for example, what I know in UK. Uh, uh, yes. it's, it's not as bad, uh, especially the family allowance, maternity leaves, those kind of things are really well covered. Uh, it's not perfect. It's still uh, you know, element of the state that has not enough funding. So probably, and I would expect that they could use more information system to also uh, manage you know, the, the scarcity of the resources, which is the most tempting thing to do um, and to, to introduce and justify introducing such kind of mechanism as I was describing with this whole talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, Idrik, I would love to continue this conversation. Unfortunately, I think um, the time is almost over. So I would like to express my um, thank you because this was such an insightful and a very um, thought-provoking conversation. Um, I think... I should also thank the DFF, um, the Digital Freedom Fund, for making this possible. And if I'm not wrong, I would like to um, pass the floor to Judith in order to make some final words and to say goodbye to us all. Yedrick, thank you once more for this conversation. I learned a lot. I hope also that the audience um, thinks the same. Thank you so much as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, this was an extremely interesting uh, webinar. Uh, thank you so much for moderating this event, Cengiz, uh, so splendidly. And also th thank you, Yedrek, for talking us through not just the detail of the case, but also your work with the affected communities. I think it was particularly interesting to listen uh, to, you know, how this work has affected you personally and, you know, how this is a difference maybe to the way in which uh, lawyers often find themselves working just within the strictures of the law, so to speak. Um, right. So please note, everyone, that this webinar has been recorded and that the recording will be made available on our website and our YouTube channel soon for those of you who want to revisit anything that was discussed today. And for those who couldn't attend, of course, today. So if you want to, um, you know, tell anybody else about the fact that this has happened and that there is material out there for the academics among you, feel free to use the video in your teaching and your research. Um, and let me just again uh, also respond to Cengiz and thank our speaker and our moderator profusely for being with us today. And uh, we are going to continue this series next week with our uh, next event, which will be where we will be joined by Kevin Deliban and Shannon Waller to talk about automating care, challenging assessment by computer in Arkansas. Um, there is still time to register for that event by following the link on our website. But for now, thank you, everybody, very much for participating. Uh, thank you, the team from DFF, who has, have, have, as always, worked really tire tirelessly in the background. And thank you, most of all, our audience, who has been uh, brilliant with bringing us so many questions that have really made this event special. So thanks, everyone. And um, I hope that you enjoyed the discussions and it is now safe to leave. Thank you. Bye.